Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to our webinar, uh, the third one this um, uh, this month, and we are going to talk today about um, pathway to creating more sustainable jobs for young Africans. And uh, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to write to us uh, right below in the comment sessions. So for the discussion today, we have um, uh, Jacqueline Modis. Uh, Jacqueline Modis, uh, she is um, a human rights activist and the Refugee Rights Network volunteer at Amnesty International. And uh, something that I want to state is that she speaks six language at different professions that's amazing and uh so uh our host is going to be jeff jeff jacqueline jeff uh and jacqueline welcome uh to to the today's webinar thank you so much for having us thank you for having us great uh, great. So um, the, the today's webinar will last approximately, let me say, 30 minutes. Uh, it depends on how the question will be answered by our uh, guest speaker. But of course, we can go a little bit further. And uh, the the host will be Jeff. Jeff, the stage is yours. And um, let's learn together. Awesome. Thank you, Rogerio. Thank you for introducing us. Um, so Jacqueline, we just have a few questions for you. Um, and I wanted to start out by first asking if you um, have anything that you would like to speak about um, regarding uh, your connection to Youth Reference Hub, why you're here, um, perhaps why you were connected with Rogerio, just so people know a little bit more background about you. Okay, so I will, am invited to this webinar because I have Rogerio on LinkedIn and he uh, sent me the information about this webinar as he saw that I was part, I was selected to be, to be, to take part in a, a round table for the BRICS Youth uh, Association, the South African branch. So he saw um, what I had done there and then he asked if I, I would be wanting to join this uh, webinar today. So I said, yes, I would love to, especially with regards to the pro the progression of not only the continent, but specifically African youth, which is what we're here today. So I'm definitely very excited to be here. Nice. Well, we'll just get right into it. I'm glad to have you here too. Um, so our first question, uh, a little bit broad, but uh, let's see if, if you have a good opinion on it. Um, so, although Africa is a continent mostly inhabited by young people, this age group is the most affected by unemployment. In your opinion, what factors are behind this? So, in my opinion, I believe that the factors that are rapidly increasing unemployment are largely linked to skills training as well as skills training. And obviously the big, not the big elephant in the room, but then there's also a lot of corruption. But then um, I'm, I'm currently in this answer going to focus on skills training as well as identifying what is needed in the in, uh, market space. So let's say, for example, there are certain areas that are highly saturated and areas that really do require a lot of people to be in those areas. So I think us as, as young Africans and the world at large, we need to really even Africans in the diaspora we need to really look at what is actually needed in the market space so that we can occupy those spaces and uh, increase our skills so that we can offer those skills into that and also not only um, focusing on one area but also understanding that the world is definitely changing so it, it's globalization is definitely with us and will be with us so you need to embrace technology so it's important that us as young africans take on the changes that come on with the growth of the world so that we definitely move away from the digital divide so that we integrate and that way we'll be able to collectively move forward Thank you. That was uh, well covered. Um, when you talk about skills training, what exactly do you mean by that? 
So let's say, for example, there is a shortage of uh, maybe scientists, right? Or um, maybe doctors or mechanics or um, woodwork people, right? So I suggest that from a young age, you have those subjects instilled in, let's say, maybe woodwork or science. You, you sort of have uh, groups that are available for teaching these students from primary school or high school in such a way that you teach them at their level. So in terms of skills training, we could start there. And also when the students are in university college or the end of high school, you could expose them to certain um, volunteering opportunities. So that would also lie a lot with um, organizations or centers and so forth. It would also lie a lot with them so that they can access um, so that the organizations and centers are able to teach the students themselves about what it takes to to be like a, a woodwork person, a mechanic, uh, maybe a scientist, understanding certain things. Because obviously, theory can only can only give you a certain portion of what you need to know in real life, and and with the theory that you have you need to apply that so that's where the skills training comes into play so i think we all have the responsibility to ensure that if let's say i want to be a mechanic then i need to position myself in such a way that i either volunteer in my area where there's a mechanic i ask that can i like come here on saturdays and see how you guys do it and that's how you can uh, gradually um increase your skills and so forth so let's say for example me um i want to grow more in the humanitarian aid uh, space. So I have constantly done like certificates online for that are linked to that. So like let's say program assistance, technical assistance, and so forth. So that's how you can also improve your skills. Nice. Yes. It's it's also yeah, it's definitely about passing down these skills. You know, not just um, identifying that they need to be taught, but knowing that they're and seeking out the right people to teach them. Um, Yes. So I'll, I'll move on to the next question because that was well covered. Um, so thank you. But uh, continuing on, which actors, government, CSOs, NGOs, private, etc., play an important role in creating the conditions for the rapid integration of young people into the labor market? I think that all those and more uh, have the responsibility along with the youth have the responsibility to ensure that um, there is integration into the workspace. So let's say, for example, um, maybe, okay, the continent of Africa is majority young people. So if you know that in an organization, a lot of people are, let's say, over the age of like 50 or so forth, there needs to be a bridging of a, a um, bridging the gap between young people and old people in certain positions and also like you said before passing on those skills and knowledge onto the young people so if you have an intern that is that is in your organization let's say fresh from university or in their final year of university and interning with your organization or company it is important that you don't just let them do like menial jobs or like they make tea for you and stuff like that but then you, you teach them in such a way that when they move from your organization and they go to their next organization or they open their organize, organization and empowering others, they are able to use that skill that you taught them and even pass it on to others. So I think it's, 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 it's definitely a, a cycle and a system. So one uh, component is also reliant on to the other and, and so forth. So you we can't necessarily place all the the weight on let's say young people needs to be more into entrepreneurship but then we also need to understand that um entrepreneurship requires certain resources and also that you can't place all the weight on let's say the government or ngos because we all need to work together in order to make sure that the circle definitely works out
Here we go. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Sorry about that. Had some difficulties there. No, anyway, um, thank you for that. It's definitely, it's, it's a, those roles rely on everyone. Obviously it is uh, spread equally. Um, so continuing on, um, young people individually though, get, focusing more specifically, what should they do to become a qualified workforce for the current labor market? Okay, so it's important that you realize the power that you have as an individual and how you can use that as a backbone to get to where you need to go. So like I said before, it's important to always upskill yourself. So if let's say you are an accountant or you are an administration person, you need to check globally, not just within your own country or within your own region, what are the current trends for your profession or what you were trained in um, globally are so that you can take like from here and apply. Obviously you need to make it relevant to you, to, to where you are and who you are and what you do. So if let's say you're an accountant, you check how other countries are, what the trend is there and how you can apply that here if possible. So it's, it's always important that you can always upskill yourself in that way and learning that you cannot work in silos or be an island. So like collaboration is also important in terms of, even though you're working individually, but then let's say you have connections like on social media or LinkedIn or wherever, um, certain groups where you guys speak about this, you discuss certain things, uh, give each other ideas and so forth, uh, even possibly create um, events or seminars and so forth with regards to what you guys want to do even as an individual like hosting your colleagues and so forth mm. when with regard to um i guess uh the role that that online collaboration plays um do you find it ever difficult um regarding internet connectivity in this age where where covid is limiting our in-person interactions do you think that um access to broadband internet connection has played a role in youth finding new jobs and being able to connect online? Yes, definitely. I mean, going back to, I think we were in first year and second year, we spoke a lot about the digital divide in communication science as well as media studies. So the digital divide is, is, is quite rampant, not only in South Africa, but on, throughout the whole continent, along with other ICT issues and electricity issues. So with everything now being online, especially with COVID, and there also being a digital divide, different economic classes and so forth, it does make it difficult for young people to access certain opportunities. So we all, um, you might not all know, but data is quite expensive in South Africa and in many parts of the continent as well um, on, on Africa. It's, it's quite expensive and not everyone has access to purchase data, even like a day's worth or even a month's worth of data. And if they do purchase data, then it's, it's sort of like some people have to weigh the options. Am I purchasing food or am I now going to purchase data? So it does become quite difficult and, um, and even if you go to places like libraries, I'm not quite sure how those work during COVID because I haven't gone into a library since uh, before COVID. So I'm not sure how the situation is right now. But um, I believe that there is Wi-Fi out like on the premises like of the library or a community center, whatever, then the young people could, could use that. But not everyone has access to internet or even a smartphone to be able to look for opportunities like on being on LinkedIn. For many of us, that's a privilege. Being on Facebook is also a privilege because some mm -hmm. people do not have smartphones. Yeah. And Wi-Fi isn't too popular right. because of the pricing and so forth. You bring up some fascinating points. Yeah, the digital divide will definitely continue to act, impact us for years to come. And it will be interesting to see how that um, develops as we move out of this um, pandemic or continue to struggle with it. Um, so I'll, I'll move on because uh, I think we covered that pretty well. Um, so another phenomenon that is very present today is job instability. It is common to see young people change jobs very often, which ultimately makes it difficult to strengthen their career. 
Why do you think this phenomenon happens and how do they take advantage of it? Okay, so job hopping and instability, in my opinion, sort of screams maybe a lack of certainty in what you're doing or what you want to do. And or maybe not seeing security in what you currently have. So that can be problematic, especially if you want to grow your personal empire in what you in what you ha are trained in or what you studied right so for young people if you want to to sort of maybe move from organization to organization or center to center um i guess it might not be the best thing to do but it needs to be done with intent right so if let's say maybe you're going to move from one organization that specializes in maybe IT and now you want to move to another organization that doesn't necessarily specialize in IT, but you have the skill for IT, that could work. But um, you need to make your moves with strategically and with intention to avoid like missing out or becoming redundant um, in your own space, even though you're a graduate or you have your master's, because that's definitely possible where you find people who are highly qualified sitting at home because they either do not have the current skills and current skills are an essential because if I am a, like a legal practitioner or so forth, I need to make sure that I read regularly. I look at what's currently trending, um, trials global affairs and so forth so that you can enrich yourself and that's also where um upskilling comes in so identify what's out there and apply it to yourself and uh, package it in such a way that it's applicable even at a different organization so turn the the situation to work in your favor yeah it's definitely uh it, it's part of not seeing the security in what you currently have can make changing a job uh, and adding intentionality to it certainly a problem. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I think checking trends though will always be essential in, in, in staying engaged with the current market and how it changes. Um, so moving on, um, if you were an employer, what would you do to keep your employees engaged and committed to your work in an ever-changing environment? So because the world changes ever so often, you, as an empl employer, you need to understand what you do and who you work with. So if you have, let's say, a group of 10, not everyone is going to be the same. That's really unrealistic to think that everyone's going to be the same just because you're working in the same place and not everyone applies the same work uh, skill. So it's important as an employer that you identify like certain things like allowing people to work from home okay let's say pre-covid allowing people to let's say maybe work three days in the office and two days at home that could give them the motivation to not always feel exhausted or burnt out because traveling is definitely part of the anxiety and stress of everyone's daily basis because um most of the time you spend probably half of your day on the road and creating an environment that is really warm and inviting, allowing your em employees to have a relationship in such a way that it's professional, but then they also understand that they can also sp uh, speak to you about certain things or express themselves and not feel like they will be attacked should they say certain things. So it's always important to read the room as an employer and understand that um, you are sort of like the guardian of the whole uh, building. And then you have these people that you're also looking after, even though they're also pouring into you. So it's always important to ensure that you not only look at what these people are giving to you for the organization, but then what you can also do in the whole organization to ensure that they do not feel like, I guess, unwanted or worthless within the workspace. Definitely, yeah. I agree. Um, definitely need to understand what you do and who you work with uh, above all, because that, that matters the most. Um, so moving on, um, for young people who have embraced entrepreneurship, it is common to see that their companies close in the, in the blink of an eye. What advice do you have for these companies to be sustainable, embrace ethical principles and international management standards? 
So with regards to entrepreneurship, um, it's not always as easy as what some people say or how it's it's sold in the world, right? So we've seen many companies and organizations or um, people that sell certain products or are promoting certain ideas. They often do um, close quite rapidly and that isn't good because for you to move into entrepreneurship you make an investment basically so the advice that i would give to entrepreneurs and upcoming entrepreneurs is that um definitely do a lot of planning as well as research so if you are working on a certain project and you want to move into entrepreneurship into that or you're already within that space then um like i mentioned before um upscale definitely and identify what's happening like global trends and so forth globally as well as within your region and within your country as well and to link what you have along with international standards that's where research comes in because you can't um just work on one thing and think that it will always generate income you need to find ways of improving and improving like how many business during COVID, especially here in South Africa, during because we're currently on level four of lockdown, so most of the restaurants had to close down and they only do strictly takeaways. So what many of those uh, restaurants do is they identified a market that, you know what, uh, we realized that during lockdown last year, which was level five, the harshest, where no one, you only go out for like groceries or emergency, like to a hospital or whatever. So they identified that gap in the market, like, okay, we'll do, we'll still do takeaways and we'll ensure that our waiters and waitresses or waiter and staff are, are, are not redundant at work. So they have created ways in which the, 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 the staff at work still is able to serve people in the car parks, giving them food and so forth. So it's, you need to definitely think ahead, always do research. You, you can't, you can't relax because this is the decision that you've made. So you need to definitely push and identify the ways of always improving and ensuring that you identify the gap in the market because there's definitely always a gap in the market and you can always collaborate with other entrepreneurs that are even in, not in the same field as you, but then maybe they could give you an idea or you could give them a service in that way. Research, research, research. It <laughs> matters so much. Um, <laughs> it really does. And uh, I think embracing ethical principles involves some research as well. You know, not, not to just dive into your company with... Um, uh, without any knowledge of, of the impact you might be making and the consequences that can come from your work. You know, you have to understand that whatever resources you are taking, you are, you are using and, and taking from a certain area and uh, have to be aware of, of that impact as well. Um, and so now this is a, this is a bigger one, but um, how do you see young Africans five years from now with regard to accessing and creating jobs? So my vision for young Africans five years from now is I definitely see bright, flourished, listening, progressive, um, elevated, and definitely working together because we, under we understand that the continent is definitely filled with amazing Africans, young Africans that do want to see change, do want to see progression. And what I see is, more working together, collaborations across the continent, eradicating all the, these ideas and challenges that definitely do separate us. So if we all definitely have one vision, we'll be able to get to where we need to go. So if you know someone who is in Sudan or someone who is in uh, Mauritania that you would like to work with, you should definitely reach out to those people and create those uh, networks and relationships. Maintaining those relationships is also essential. And that's the way forward. And we'll definitely do see more of Africans globally, even in the diaspora, definitely growing in their fields. What do you think um, regarding yourself in five years from now? How do you think you might play a role in that growth? So I definitely refer to myself as your African girl. So I, that's my tagline. So I definitely always push the agenda of Africa wherever I go and 
debunking all the myths. So I, I like I said, I want to work in the humanitarian aid, uh, space and that's where I've mostly been outside of human rights. It's also humanitarian aid space. So I would like to, to ensure that um, basically the whole continent realizes all the, the dreams and um, livelihood that they need to get. So my duty in that is it basically pouring in what I know. So with my, the advances that I have currently is the ability to speak all the languages which I do, which makes it easy for me to relate to different people across the continent, especially when I speak like mainstream languages like English, French, and Portuguese, and a bit of Swahili. Then I'll be able to integrate with those communities, pouring into them, asking them what they need. So I'll, um, I'll basically be like a young diplomat across the continent. Do you mind telling us, uh, for those who don't know, what are the six languages that you speak? So I speak English, Afrikaans, Sitsana, French, Portuguese, and Swahili. Wow, that is brilliant. <laughs> I know <laughs> it took you. some hard work for you to, to learn them all. So I, I, I really commend you and, and you know those who, those who have had the opportunity to speak with you so far. Um, in a language that is not your own, uh, are, are supremely grateful too. So um, I'll continue on. I have some of my own questions that I just want to ask you. Um, and hopefully these won't take too long um, because I know we're coming close to the end. But um, I, I want to consider, we've talked a lot about job sustainability. I, I want to also talk about environmental sustainability and how it might play a role in yeah. how young Africans choose jobs, if at all. Um, obviously, we're all looking to still get paid, um, but at the same time, we want to do so ethically, and that might not always be the case with a large paycheck. I'm wondering if you know of anyone specifically who is uh, making sure that they are, when they're searching in the job market, are doing so with um, environmental ethics in mind. Currently, at this point, I do not know anybody outside of, let's say, the humanitarian aid space. Like some people would definitely say that I would rather not work for set uh, a organization because they have a bad reputation with regards to the respect of lives. Or I would rather work in an organization that will not pollute the ocean. So even though they come out with a propaganda statement to say, um, oh, no, um, we reimburse or we have opened up um, a water pipe to give this community because of what we had done, then I, um, it's always important to consider those elements, when, especially when you're job hunting, because you wouldn't want your personal reputation to be linked to a negative image because of an organization that you worked with. So that's always something to consider. And it's always important that you consider where you live as well, because let's say, for example, when we had the cyclones um, in Mozambique and it affected a bit of South Africa, Zimbabwe and Tanzania, um, in as much as, you know, it's beautiful at the beach and everything, but then when you are looking for organizations that you would like to work with, identify organizations that protect lives, that, cons that understand climate change and do not think it's just... Um, hashtag or whatever or a movement but it's an actual thing that is definitely moving quite rapidly i mean there's an island called tuvalu and it's literally diminishing every year because of the water that's literally coming into the land and eventually later in so many years it will definitely be so small because of um rising sea levels so it's always important to consider organizations that are operating in those environments as well as um, what those organizations are basically doing. Thank you for answering. That, that was uh, very widely covered. So I appreciate that, Jacqueline. Um, and, and the last question I will just ask, um, this is something I'm curious about. Um, what role do you think social media plays in encouraging job sustainability or even the pursuit of sustainable jobs? And how can these young companies benefit from platforms like TikTok or Instagram or other ones, LinkedIn, to connect with young Africans and educate them on employment sustainability? Okay, so uh, many young people are on social media, 
um, especially now with like TikTok and Instagram, Twitter and so forth, especially YouTube. So those platforms could definitely be used to educate people and teach them about what job sustainability is for those who might not know and how to basically generate sustainability in what you have and what you are working towards and how organizations or individual companies, brands and so forth, how they can use social media to the advantage of in, in empowering others and is basically they themselves need to be on social media because um, we all know that globalization is definitely with us and we are all moving quite rapidly, especially on social media. Things are quite quick and time isn't, things are not necessarily time bound because social media uh, transpasses like uh, time zones. So you could literally be speaking to someone on the other side of the world and regardless of time, the understanding could be still be there. So it's always important to ensure that teaching is done in such a way that is relevant to the people that you're speaking to. And for that to take place, you need to understand who you're speaking to. So educating yourself is, 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 is definitely important. Going back to research on both sides. Um, it's 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 very important to ensure that you understand who you're speaking to and the audience that you want to generate to ensure that the reach is definitely 100% or close to 100%. Definitely. These are relevant platforms that are continuing to evolve. And um, so these relevant issues need to be shared on relevant platforms. So um, that's uh, thank you for touching upon that. I think that's all the questions I have. Um, if you have any yourself, Jacqueline or Rogerio, if you want to step in, um, this will just be an, an open time at the end for anyone to uh, to ask away. <laughs> so I would like to find out um, with you, Jeff, like what, how do you, okay, being for a person that is not on the continent or from the continent, right? So what do you see honestly, in terms of the, the progression of young Africans, especially in the job market space? This, this question is for Jack, for, for Jeff. <laughs> yes, sorry. for Jeff, sorry. Yes. Oh, okay, What? so can you ask it one more time? Okay, so I was asking with a person, with you being a person that is not from the continent, what is your current opinion of how the job market or basically the atmosphere is with regards to youth employment and uh, the youth at large? Um, I just, I, I definitely noticed that um, technology plays a, a heavy role um, in terms of what people are able to afford and and how that can affect their um amount of leverage in the job market i think that um this pandemic has severely affected everyone in the world but specifically with regard to um youth employment and mobility uh i think that there there are many platforms out there that allow for um the African diaspora to connect and for also youth in Africa to connect and, and to share ideals and, and information. I think that it seems somewhat limited right now just because of the how access to internet and the digital divide works. Um, but I, I think that it's a matter of, of catching up a little bit too, and, and that's going to take some time. Um, but there there will continue to be a growth in Africa of, of youth who are entrepreneurs and who want to seek out meaningful work. Um, and I find that I've, I've already sort of explored that in the realm of the music industry. And I think that that's, that's one area where um, many young Africans are making great strides. Um, and so uh, I'd be interested to see how the music industry can play a role in helping youth seek employment. I think that they can be they can have a more symbiotic relationship and i think that music as a universal language can transcend some of these language barriers within the continent mm. to allow people to connect on a deeper level and then in in hopes fuel uh, fuel more uh meaningful change and meaningful work so um i, I guess that's a long-winded answer saying I, I don't really know but um I'm, I'm doing my best to understand each day um as someone who is who's not 
even been to Africa yet. Um, but you know, it is, uh, yeah, I I'm learning. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Oh yeah, so Jared. Do you, any, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I uh, I really like the the conversation. It was very very um, useful, and you did great. You ha you answered great all the questions, and I believe that uh, everyone who who will watch or is watching this webinar right now, uh, you got the point, and maybe. We are uh, uh, in this fight together to create more sustainable jobs for young Africans. This is a kind of challenge that we, we will not like stop today. We will not overcome this challenge today, but it's a process. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, that the future will, will be um, bright for everyone in Africa. And thank you very much, um, uh, Jacqueline. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, uh, for, for that amazing conversation. Uh, we will continue doing this kind of uh, sessions. And of course, we will be uh, counting on, on people like you, Jacqueline, and like you, Jeff, uh, to conduct this kind of, of um, webinars. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, stay safe and uh, protect yourself against COVID. <laughs> yes, definitely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. Jackie. It was great meeting you. <laughs> great meeting yeah. you 